as we go now, we're still in, we're in session four. We're still in the things which are. We're going to look at a couple of the book of the letters today. But uh, in a little bit of review, we want to talk about remember the fourfold theory for the letters. We have four theories of how to interpret these, and I believe actually all four are correct. There are actual churches. There, you know, we've seen our our uh, map admonitory. There to all churches. Okay, this letter can the letter to the church of Ephesus and the letter to the church of Smyrna and the letter to the church of Sardis and Thyatira and Sardis and, and, and Pergamum and all of these they can all be used for First Baptist Church of Sharon. And every local church is a makeup of one of these seven churches. Some of them are all in, in the, into Smyrna. Some of them are all in into Philadelphia, and then some of them are a mix and a match. And matter of fact, I would say 95% of all churches are a mix match. Okay. Homiletic. Every letter says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this means that this is for you. He who has an ear. Do you have ears? I've got, I've got two. So I guess what the Lord is telling me is that this is for me too. Because I have ears. All right. So if you have ears and you can hear, and if you can hear in a spiritual sense, meaning you can read the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is living in you, then this is for you. And finally, the prophetic. Remember, each church represents a prophetic period of time, and there's multiple reasons for that. And then, real quick, we have the sevenfold structure. We have the name of the church there. And remember, the name of the church really denotes their character. And that shows the sovereignty of God in establishing churches. That God would establish a church, okay, after a town that had been in existence for thousands of years prior to the writing of the letter. And as we're going to see today, I believe that Smyrna existed in 3000 B.C. And that long ago, God named that town and then put a church there that represented the name of that town. And so as we get deeper into that, you guys will see that. We see a title of Christ. We see that most uh, five of the churches have a commendation. Five of the churches have condemnation. They receive counsel for overcoming and enduring. And they get that promise. And then he says, uh, listen. All right. So we talked about Ephesians. The biggest takeaway from the book of Ephesus, or I'm sorry, the letter to the Ephesians that Jesus said, is evaluate your devotion. That's the homiletic application for you is it doesn't matter how involved you are in your local church and what you're doing. Okay, that's important. Don't get me wrong. But what's more important is your devotional life. And how I can liken that, and you and I, every one of us here has seen this, and it may be you, I don't know. But every one of us has certainly seen this over the course of our Christian lives. You've known people who were at the church every time the doors were open. They were constantly working, working, working. All the time. They were in this ministry, that ministry. They had, they had their fingers in every pot. Okay? But you could tell by their character that maybe their devotional life wasn't what it should be. Okay? So what they had is the cart before the horse. And that's what the letter to the Ephesians is. Put the horse first and then drag your works behind you. Okay? So, today... We're going to look at Smyrna. Remember, we're in a cycle here, and we're going to look at Pergamum. So, first of all, Smyrna. There it is, 3000 BC. That's a long time ago. That was when that area was first inhabited. Today, it's the third largest city in Turkey called Izmir. That's the name. If, if you look on a map today, you're not going to find Pergamum or Pergamos. It's Izmir. And it's the third largest city in Turkey. Okay, so what's the name mean? It means sweet smelling. It means suffering or death. Now that's real important. When you Now if you go back and think about that church, uh, the letter to Smyrna, they were always being persecuted, weren't they? Isn't that what Jesus was saying? You guys, hey, I know you're, you're standing strong, you know. I know you're being persecuted. Some of you are going to be thrown in prison for 10 days. You know, 
and we'll talk about what that means. It's amazing that that church that was going through those characteristics, that name, the, their, the name of their town meant suffering. And so once again, we see the sovereignty of God in, in thousands of years, knowing that, you know what, there's going to be a church one day that I'm going to write a letter to, and they're going to be a bunch of suffering Christians, so I'm going to get this town named Smyrna. God's in everything. Also, those names seem to contradict each other. Sweet smelling. Sweet smelling in terms of a sacrifice. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, it, and it all is part of the Greek, how you look at the Greek words. Because uh, Greeks, you know, have a root, a root word. And then you add some stuff and take it this way. You can take it this way, but it all revolves back down to the root. And so we get that sweet-smelling offering. Remember, the scripture says the prayers go up as a sweet-smelling incense. Okay? And sacrifice is a sweet-smelling, it's a sacrifice offering to God. Okay? So, yeah, that, that is true. They do, on the, on the surface, look like they contradict. But the way the Greek language works, they actually, they're the same. Just to, we have, and I, I can't think of any offhand, but we do have English words where they, they kind of look like they might be different words, but they come from the same root. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Jesus' words about himself. He's the first and the last who died and came back to life. Now, we talked about that in Isaiah 41. In Isaiah 46, I believe it is. Where God, Jehovah God, is saying, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no one. And this is a great verse to actually use uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses who say that Jesus is not God. Uh, well, when did Jehovah die and come back to life? The only way he did that was through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yet Jesus Christ now has called himself the first and the last. He's using the very title. And if we go back into chapter 1, we see that title again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, which is the first and the last. Mm -hmm. And so here we have specific, cannot contradict it. There is no other interpretation Jesus Christ saying, I am first and last. I am God. Because that is a title that every Jew knew was God. Now, in the context of our day, most Christians, if you say who's the first and the last, no. They might think of, you know, okay, first Cowboys first quarterback, you know. <laughs> but if you mention this back in the first century to a Jew, they knew exactly who you were talking about. But this is a this is Jehovah. It's commendation. He says you have works, you have patience, and you're poor. Now, I find that interesting that it's poverty is a commendation. Because in our society, that's a condemnation. We kind of look at poverty as a, as a bad thing, but what Jesus is saying here is they've made themselves poor for the gospel of Christ. Because in that day... Yeah, unlike this day, in that day, your faith, that it could really have some serious implications on your pocketbook. Okay? Especially right after this, as we get into this, this prophetic period that Smyrna is talking about, which is the, from about 100 AD to 312, and we'll talk about that. If you know your church history, that is when the church was most persecuted up until this last century. Uh, this last century saw more persecutions than all that combined. But up until this last century, the church was severely persecuted under the Roman Empire between 100 A.D. and 312 A.D. So because of that, it does not have one condemnation. Not one bad word is said about Smyrna. They received some counsel. He said, uh, be faithful and don't fear. So... Many of you, if you, if, and I know you, some of you may remember this, but whenever you hear me pray, especially about people who are being martyred for Christ overseas, when you hear me pray about our Christian brothers and sisters in Africa and China, what you're going to hear me always pray is, Lord, help them to stay faithful and help them to not be afraid. Help them to be bold. Because when you get fear, you're not bold. And so how that applies to us today is even today, what we want to do is when we're remembering our brothers and sisters across this globe that are persecuted, we need to remember to pray for them to be faithful to the point of death and to not fear it. 
meant to stand firm. Because that's the exact same advice that Christ gave to the church of Smyrna. Okay? And if Christ gave that advice to those undergoing persecution, it's probably a good thing that we should pray for that. Now, they received a, a reward for being faithful. They're going to give the crown of life. And we know from James 1.12 that the crown of life is for all those who have suffered for Christ's sake. Now, the cutoff of that, I have no idea. That's something that God will do. Do you have to physically suffer? Do you have to emotionally suffer? I don't know. Uh, that's something that God's the one that hands out the crowns. And we have five crowns, and this is one of them. Okay? This is the, the crown of life for those who are basically martyrs. They call it the martyr's crown. And not hurt by the second death, which is all the way at the end of the book of Revelation. The second death is the great white throne judgment. That's when, uh, when you meet people and you talk to them about Christ, and they tell you, well, I just believe that by my good works, that way my bad works, and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Right here is when they're judged. That's when those books are open. You, you want to stand before this? With your merits, that's not a wise decision, I don't think. But that's when that is. And we know that because they didn't have a word of condemn, uh, condemnation, they were commended. And the Lord says, be faithful and fear not. We know that they will not be hurt by the second death. In other words, they're not even going to be there. And guess what? Neither are you. I don't know if we get to watch it from the mezzanine. I don't think so. I think God probably would rather us not see this. Because you know what? They're going, to see, they're going to be some people we know. There's going to be some family members. There's going to be some children, some parents, some aunts and some uncles, some best friends. And I would hate for them to be able to look up at me as I'm standing there watching them be judged for all eternity at the great white throne and say, why did you not tell me anything? Uh, we did a very powerful skit and i talked to joe about doing it uh, we did this back when i was in youth group and what it was is there's four teenagers and they had gone from a youth group uh the, the, the skit was they had left like a pizza place on a youth night out and there were four of them and they were killed in a car accident and now they're standing before god and we had a, a man up there with a big booming voice, had a choir robe on. And uh, step forward, please. And one by one, everybody went forward. And every, everyone was in, welcome, you know, enter into my rest. You know, you who I love and are beloved by my father. And then there came me. And everybody was like, hey, this is easy. Come on. You, can, you know, because, hey. I said I was a Christian, all right? And I stand before him, and he's like, he starts frantically, and the, guy, and the guy playing Jesus is frantically looking through the books, can't find my name. And it's not like he goes, up, oh, sorry. He's, he's desperately searching. I'm not there. And then I have two bigger guys. They come out of the choir loft, and they come and they grab me. They seize me and started dragging me. And as I'm being drugged, I'm looking at each one of these. You're my sister. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why didn't you make? Sh why didn't you share your faith with me? I thought it was just going to church. You know, you're my best friend since third grade. Why didn't you share it with me? And finally, I'm drugged through the choir loft room, the choir room, and the doors are shut, and the lights go off. Very powerful. I mean, very powerful. Well, that's what that is. And I don't think the Lord in His infinite love. It's going to want us to see that. He who has an ear, there it is again. So, we see that always that the promises will not be heard by the second death. That we get these rewards. But look, look what's, in, what's interesting here is that is that the promise always follows hearing. Notice that? He who has an ear, let him hear. The one who conquers will not be heard. It doesn't say the one who conquers will not be heard. He who has an ear, let him hear. The hearing is first. And hearing in this context is listening and obeying and understanding. In other words, these rewards are not for you if you're not hearing. Remember, everything in the Bible is there for a reason and it's in the order for a reason. 
And this is interesting. Okay, it's something that we need to really pay attention to. So, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. So, we have a messed up view in America of what wealth is, what richness is. And if you've ever done any mission trips, some of the happiest people I've ever seen have been overseas in poverty. I'm like, why are you smiling? Why, you know, I think we would all be ready to, to cash it in if we were living in those conditions. But you guys have seen them. Little kids in Africa, that they're, they're a toy, they have a community toy that's like a wheel that they move around with a stick and they're just happy. They got a soccer ball that they put together with a bunch of newspaper and wrapped it in duct tape. They're happy. Uh, my, my former missions pastor actually has one of those in, on his, in his bookshelf. It reminds him. <coughs> you know, these African kids gave it to him, which was a big deal. And he went out and bought a real soccer ball. And they gave that to him. And it's a reminder. Hey, you know what? It's, it's, there's something bigger out there. Okay. Um, the slander of those who say they are Jews and not. They are the synagogue of Satan. Now, it's, re it's important to remember that the early persecution of the church was not the Romans. It was the Jews. And there's some examples. And we'll, these will be in your notes uh, that I post on the internet and, and on YouTube and send out tomorrow. Uh, these are the places we see in Acts where the Jews really started persecuting the church. And so notice what he says. They are Jews. They think they are Jews, but they are not. Okay? These people that were doing the persecution were Jews, but Jesus says basically, I've disavowed them. And if Jesus says you're not something, I don't care what you say you are, but you're not. Okay? They are actually the synagogue of Satan. So, I wanted to show this, and then we'll get back to that synagogue of Satan. Uh, this is a, a piece of information that's like, hmm, what does this mean? Ten days. Well, there, I have to tell you, there are a lot of theories about what this means. Uh, when you guys read it, you probably like, you're going to have ten, ten days of tribulation. I don't One thing that the Greek word can mean is a literal day, or it can be a period of time. Okay, the Greeks in their specific language were not real specific sometimes. And they rely, you relied on context to actually interpret the word. Well, what's interesting is that the, from the time the Christian persecution really started till the time it ended, there were 10 Roman emperors. And so the main theory is that the, the, the 10 days, it means 10 periods of time of persecution. And that also goes into the, this is a prophetic overview. Okay, so, so we have it to the church, we have to, to all churches, we have it to you individually, and then we have a prophetic time frame that this covers, a church, period of church history. And this is one of those pieces of evidence that lends credence to that, is that there was no other day when you have 10 days of persecution. It never happened in the history of Smyrna Church. So it has to be something symbolic. And so what we think it means is 10 periods of time, and there were 10 Roman emperors that really persecuted the church. Some of them in varying degrees. Okay. Uh, this was the worst. Diocletian. All right. Domitian, he's the one that, that exiled John. And then we have various, uh, some of these weren't real bad, and then some of them were really bad. Okay. They, the, the persecution of the church kind of went like this. All right. So, we see as prophetic fulfillment is that first, the couple of hundred years there where the church was really persecuted. Now, what is his application to us? Endure. All right? So we have evaluate your devotion and we have endure. Okay? Now, so uh, I'm going to skip through this real quick. Uh, these are what Pergamon was famous for. Uh, Anybody recognize that symbol? Mm -hmm. Asclepius. Well, you probably recognize that one. Okay, this guy was a famous healer that actually thought he was a god. He lived in Pergamum. All right? Pretty crazy. Uh, so anytime you see a medical thing, you can think now Pergamum. Because now we're on Pergamum. We're not on Smyrna. We're on Pergamum. This is where this guy was from. All right? So it lets you know how, how old that city is. 
So what does the name mean? It means exalted, elevated, or married. Now this is important. Uh, Which name? Married. You're gonna, yeah, it's important because it means, Pergamum means married. And when you see the prophetic fulfillment of this church, you're really gonna go, oh, wait, okay, if you know anything about church history, okay? What happened in the early Roman, well, I don't wanna get there yet. We'll go back here. Okay, so here's his title. He has a sharp two-edged sword. In other words, he's the word of God, right? Jesus is the word of God. That's what John chapter one says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. And then we see down in verse 14, and the word became flesh and tabernacled, which is a very key point, tabernacled, built its house with us. Okay, so he's the word of God. The com commendation, they have held fast to the name of Christ. They're still holding on to who Jesus was, is what Jesus is saying. You still hold tight to my personage. But, ho oh, ho, there's a big but. <laughs> Condemnation. You allow false teachers in. Okay? And there, there's the, the scripture. You have some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block. So, what was happening here is that people in the church were starting to create stumbling blocks through rules and regulations. And remember, uh, the, the Jerusalem Council here, in Acts 15 and 16, we have the Jerusalem Council. And they basically said there's only two restrictions. Avoid sexual immorality and don't eat things offered to idols. Okay, those were the two things that James finally said, okay, this is what we should do. But they're allowing false teachers in, and, and we're going to look at that in a second. And they were putting stumbling blocks. Now remember... You can still do this and still get a commendation from the Lord. That's important to remember. That, you know what? There are certain things that are heresy that cause you to lose your salvation. And then there's other things that are just false teachings. Now, and I have said this on numerous times, and I'll say it again. Everybody who teaches the Word of God is to some extent or another a false teacher. Everybody. I don't care if it's Chuck, me, David, whoever. Everyone is a false teacher. And here's why. Because none of us have it 100% right. Absolutely no one can open that Bible and interpret everything 100%. It just doesn't happen. That means at some point in time, you have told somebody what you think something means and you were wrong. You taught falsely. Everybody got, you got where I am? So when you go on the internet, which I'm prone to do, and you see all of these critics of all of these ministries. I mean, if you'll go out there, you'll see people condemning Henry Blackaby for writing Experiencing God, believe it or not. And what's interesting is that this is a pride issue amongst these people. Because I guarantee you, they're a false teacher too. Henry Blackaby, does he have it all right? No, he does not. No one does. Not one person. There are things that I have taught from the pulpit that I one day will give an account for, and even though I thought 100% that they were right, they were wrong. And it may be some big issue like losing your salvation or predestination or something, I don't know, and it may be some minor issue, okay? It may be this, <laughs> okay? I don't know, we'll know one day. So whenever we teach the word, we have to be very careful to remember to be humble. This is my interpretation, what I feel the Lord saying, but you know what? I could be wrong. I could be wrong. <clears throat> but there's a difference between being a false teacher and being a heretic. We are real quick in today's church to throw around the term heresy. That's heresy. No, it's not. Unless it's a teaching that causes you to lose your salvation. Okay? Teaching a pre-trib rapture, if you're a post-trib rapture person, is not heresy. Because there are pre-trib people going to heaven. Even if we're all wrong about the tribulation. Even if, even if it's really, if we were should have looked at this as a preterist point of view. Guess what? We're still saved. I'm teaching falsely. And you're believing falsely. And one day God's going to maybe sit us down and go, Why did you think that was, that was all allegory? What are you talking about? Or that got fulfilled in 70 AD. Okay. 
Sorry. Should have wrote them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so they received some counsel. Repent. They received the counsel. And then their reward is they're going to get hidden manna. Now this is, this is a whole other topic. Hidden manna. Remember what manna was. It's literally, what is it? So this is even worse. It's not only what is it, but it's hidden what is it. All right? <laughs> so, and he's going to give them a white stone. You're going to have a stone one day. It's got a new name. You're going to get, you're going to get, if you didn't like your name, you're always like, why did they name me Nelson? I don't get it. Well, guess what? I'm getting a new one. And so are you. So if you're real proud of your name, David Lee over there, yeah. guess what? <laughs> God's going to give you a new one. Okay? And nobody else is going to know it. We're all going to be walking around with little white rocks in our pocket going, <laughs> you don't know my name. <laughs> that would be a route, right? Yeah. So, okay. Now, this is what I wanted to talk about. Some of you, now remember what the Church of Ephesus, what they said about the, the Nicolaitans? No. Remember back in the book, of, uh, right to the letter of the Ephesians, he says, you hate the works of, of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, look what's happened in a couple of hundred years. Although this is happening at the present day in Pergamum, it really starts going on in this church history and after the fourth century. You have some now holding the teaching. Yes, sir. I just wanted to repeat the Nicolaitans. Okay, the Nicolaitans, what we there are several theories, but given that we're this sits in church history the best the word nicolaitan if you if you break it down in the greek it means ruler of people in other words you're ruling over the people like like a king you know you're a dictator of people is really literally what it means and and that was apparently a sect that had risen and what it was was a priestly sect where people had started to seize power not from rumor. We don't operate. We, even though we're Congregationalist Baptists, that's not the way the Bible is set up. Okay, the Bible is set up with elders. Okay, and Hebrews thirteen seventeen says, "Obey those who have rule over you in the Lord." All right. But what was happening is that there were some people like Diotrephes, Third John, verses nine and ten, who loved to have the preeminence, and they thought they run the whole show. There was no input from anybody. It's my way or the highway. So what Pergamum is having is they've got some of these people who are holding to that teaching. Yes, I'm in charge. All right, and that's God condemned. Because remember, in verse 6 of chapter 2 to the Ephesians, he says, I hate the works. You hate them, and I hate them too. But we have a compromise. So, this, let's see what time we got. Time. The, where Satan's throne is, I told you we'd get back to that. Well, the mm -hmm. synagogue of Satan. Well, now we got where Satan's throne is. Now, this is very interesting. You held fast to my name, and, that you, and you did not deny the faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Okay. Very important. Throne. Where Satan's throne is. Throne is a seat of power. That's your, if you have a throne, that's where you're, even though you may, you know, be living in another, you know, Queen Elizabeth has a throne. And when she's sitting on that, that's she's speaking from a seat of power. Okay? Well, we have to take some history back. And as we start to look at church history, okay, or when we go even before church history, remember Tammuz was born in Nimrod uh, and Samarius. Or Semiranius, I'm sorry. Uh, the sun god, he dies at winter solstice, resurrects as the days get longer. He's celebrated by burning a Yule log. Now you have to understand that Satan knew exactly the plan of redemption. And so what he was going, his plan was is if he couldn't thwart it in the Garden of Eden and he couldn't thwart it by killing all the Jews, what he decided he would do is make mimicry of it ahead of time. Satan knew that Jesus was going to come born of a virgin. Well, guess what? Tammuz was born of Nimrod in Semiramis. And he died. And he rose again in the, in the myth. Now, they trimmed the tree for him too. So if you read Jeremiah 10, and you get some people who say we shouldn't have Christmas trees, that's where they get it from. Because that was a pagan witch ritual that they did to celebrate the rising of Tammuz. 
okay? And they also had mistletoe, which is fertility. That's the reason why you get a big kiss on the cheek or the lippers, okay? So what happened in Pergamum and why this inter intersects is Augustus started emperor worship. Remember how they used to worship the emperors? You would give your little peach offering or whatever, and, that was, and that's what Christians refused to do. This all started in Pergamum. That's the seat of Satan. That's what Jesus is saying, is that the seat of all of this evil, it started there. Okay? It became the center of a religious uh, emperor worship, and the first temple was built uh, Ves Vespasian. Okay? In 27 B.C. Now, what does that temple look like, you ask? There it is. Stop. You stop. So, there it is. You don't steal my thunder, brother. Okay, this is actually an archaeological excavation. It is. It's in a museum. But this was actually called the seed of Satan. Now, we kind of allegorize seed of Satan. And we read that in Revelation 2 and we think it's an allegory. Or yeah. When you talk to the, the Christians of the day in Pergamum, they said where seed of Satan is, they probably went, I don't see anybody sitting over there right now. Because that was there and they called it the seed of Satan. So that is not some allegory. That is not some illustration. That was actually an actual title. If, if, they, if they said, you know, if Jesus said, I, you, you know, we're the where the, the guy at the Quick Mart is, you would all go, well, okay, there's a guy at the Quick Mart. Well, this is the seat of Satan. Well, <coughs> Hitler was a big fan of this. Matter of fact, he had it taken to Berlin. And then, he had a replica made. That's the Nuremberg rallies. That was just a coincidence, though, right? Yeah, and here's, a, <laughs> what an awesome segue. Yes. Because here's another coincidence. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, there you go. There's the original. The original seat of Satan. Now, now, what was here was an altar, by the way. And it's not in the, they didn't, they weren't able to excavate it. It's gone. There's an altar here. That's where they would heat up a bronze calf to burning hot, glowing hot, and it had a, a lid, basically. And they would throw babies in it, <clears throat> alive. And there's your altar position. Now, I'm not making any political statements. No political statements. I'm just, point of information. Uh, Yes, it is. Yes, it. Booed God. Yeah. They had, I can't remember the exact uh, thing that they were trying to vote on. Uh, as a plat it was a platform. It wasn't like the rally, you know, that the, the not things that's on TV. It's one of the things where they're doing the platform and where they had tried to vote to take God out or something like that. And they tried to rush the vote through instead of actually listening. It was a sham. It really was. Even, even Democrats were like, what are y'all doing? And I can't remember the exact phrase, but they actually booed God. They booed him. Uh, it's on YouTube. Matter of fact, I'll look it up and I'll send it out this week. So, it's prophetic fulfillment. The persecuted church. Okay, I'm sorry. That should uh, take that out. Pers not the persecuted church. The persecuted church was Smyrna. Pergamum is the married church, the indulged church, from about 312 A.D. to 600 A.D. And if you remember, uh, that period of time is when church and state got married. All right? Another amazing coincidence that Pergamum means married, and all of the things that are going on in that church mimic the stuff that happened at this time. Where the church started marrying into the state. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And it's, it's word to us, uh, don't compromise. 
Do not compromise with the world. That's his message to us. Now let's go back to Mary. Okay, so during this time, this is what happened. Union of church and state married. Remember, uh, Constantine said he saw a vision of a big cross. He said, under this sign, conquer. Constantine was not a baptized believer until his deathbed. He still wanted to do his pagan stuff. But um, when Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon, they founded a new center over in Turkey in, in, at Pergamos. And that king became Pontifex Maximus. That sound familiar? Is that a name that sounds familiar? Oh, it will in a second. And he was the high priest of the pagan system. That Pontifex Maximus. Uh, the cult from Pergamus to Rome got transferred uh, with the appointment of each successive Caesar as the high priest of the Roman cult. And finally, in the uh, 378 AD to 395 AD, Theodosius made Christianity the state religion. All Constantine did was say you can't be persecuted for your Christianity. But it wasn't until the late 4th century that Theodosius said, this is who you will serve. And then finally, this bishop in Rome, uh, he completed the absorption of Babylonianism. You want to know why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? Here. You want to know why you have a Christmas tree? Here. You want to know why they burn a Yule log? Here. And then mistletoe. Why we have mistletoe? Why is it called Easter? It's Ishtar. Mm -hmm. The goddess of fertility. <clears throat> Jesus didn't walk around saying, hey, it's Easter time. <laughs> he said it's Passover. That's right. And that's one of my big bugaboos to this day is that we as a church don't celebrate Easter all the time at the same time as Passover, which is what it should be. Because that's when Jesus was crucified was at Passover. He wasn't crucified at some other time of the month. He was crucified then. Right. And so we're being a little disobedient when we have Easter morning and Passover is the next month. And next year is really going to be bad because Passover is about a month removed from when we're going to celebrate Easter. But we operate on a religious system. And it was finally Pope Leo I who assumed the title Pontifex Maximus. To this day, the Pope is called Pontifex Maximus. And that title originates from here. Okay? Again, this is, I'm not making a statement. This is just statements of fact. This is stuff that is, you can't argue with this. This is history. Even though some people have made a really good use of arguing with history lately. So, finally, Ephesus, mind your devotion. Smyrna, endure persecution. Pergamos, purify your ambassadorship. Don't compromise. On your personal level, Ephesus is don't neglect your priorities. Don't misprioritize your Christian life. Smyrna, you're going to have satanic opposition. Satan is a real being and he's going to oppose you. And Pergamos, finally, again, don't compromise. Okay? And I know we're, I'm going to have to do, do two churches next week. Uh, there's a lot there, I know. That's why I, send, that's why I do it on the video and I send out the, the notes. Um, but what is your first thoughts about this? What are your thoughts? That match, huh? That deep? It is deep. It is deep to learn about the different churches, to learn you know, what, what each word means. I think that opens your eyes All right. to uh, the understanding. To me, it's amazing that God, it just shows the sovereignty of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That he... You know, Pergamum, he, he, that town's been around for thousands of years. And he said, if we're going to plant a town there named Mary, and I'm going to put a church there that's going to represent compromising with the world. Pergamum is still called Pergamum today? No. No. It's not. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it now. All right. Well, uh, for next week, we're going to look at... Uh, uh, Sardis and Thyatira, those two. So if you were just in your, you know, the end of chapter two, the beginning of chapter three for next week, just look at those churches, okay? 
and trying to get a guess of uh, what we're going to talk about. Because uh, as we get closer, especially with Sardis, what we're going to see is that it, ref it, it represents the Reformation. And we're going to see that God said there was nothing good about it, which was a really surprising thing to me. Okay? So let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Gracious Father, I just thank you for this time. Lord, it's, there's just so much here. Father, uh, we're so blessed to be able to study your word. We're so blessed, Father, to, to sit here right now and hear the sound of children playing and laughing. And Father, that is a tremendous blessing to us. Father, it's so wonderful to, to live in this freedom. But Lord, I pray that uh, we as Christians, as we go through our week this week, help us to remember to set our priorities straight and help us to remember to endure and to be faithful. And Father, show us areas where we may be compromising our faith. Father, speak to each one of us individually uh, and show us, do I have a foot in the world and in the church? And then Father, if we do, I pray that you would give us the firm conviction and uh, just strengthen us and help us to move both feet into your church and where you would have us be. And Father, how you would have us walk, uncompromising, Father, and faithful with proper priorities. So we give you praise, Lord. We thank you. In Christ's name, amen.